I'm delighted to introduce the moderator of our first panel, Dan Kessler. Dan is the Keith and Jan Hurlbut Senior Fellow and Director of Research at the Hoover Institution. He is also a professor at Stanford Law School and the Stanford Graduate School of Business in the Political Economy Group. He has published in leading journals across law, economics, and political science, not ever. <laughs> so thanks, Dan, for launching the first session. Thank you, Brandis. Thanks for that very nice introduction. Uh, with that, maybe let me introduce uh, all of our panelists here today, and I'll start uh, at the end and, and work my way work my way uh, backwards. Um, uh, at, at the end is uh, Philip Hamburger. Phil, Philip is the Maurice and Hilda Friedman Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. Uh, Philip's work focuses on constitutional law and its history. He's also established the Galileo Center at Columbia, which is devoted to freedom of speech and inquiry, uh, and is the founder and CEO of the New Civil Liberties Alliance, an independent nonprofit civil rights organization based in Washington that litigates to defend constitutional freedoms from the administrative <clears throat> state. Uh, next, we have our own Michael McConnell. Uh, Michael is a senior fellow at Hoover and the Richard and Francis Mallory Professor of Law at Stanford. Uh, Michael directs the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School and served as a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit from 2002 to 2009. His book, The President Who Would Not Be King, Executive Power Under the Constitution, is a winner of the Thomas M. Cooley Book Prize for the best book in that year in constitutional history. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Andrew uh, Rudlevich, who's the Thomas Brackett Reed Professor of Government at Bowdoin College. Uh, he's currently visiting at, at LSE uh, and an honorary professor affiliated with University College London's Center on United States Politics. Uh, Andrew's work focuses on the modern presidency, uh, the executive branch, interbranch relations, and his most recent book, By Executive Order, uh, Bureaucratic Management and Limits of Presidential Power, was awarded the best book of the year on the presidency by the American Political Association. <coughs> uh, finally, next, next to me here is uh, Sharice Thrower. Sharice is a visiting fellow at Hoover and associate professor of political science at Vanderbilt. Sharice uh, is a chancellor's fellow, and her research focuses on American political institutions, the politics of separation of powers, interbranch policy making, and executive power. In 2022, Sharice uh, co-authored uh, the book Checks in the Balance, which I've read, uh, Legislative <laughs> Capacity and the Dynamics of Executive Power, which won the 2022 Alan Rosenthal Prize for the best book on practical legislative studies and the 2023 Richard Neustadt Award for the best book on executive politics from the American Political Science Association. Thank you all for, for being here. A pleasure to have you and thank you for, uh, for coming to, to listen to us. So um, I'd like to start out with just some uh, questions to, to our panelists. Maybe ask you to speak for sort of five minutes or so. I don't wanna uh, cut anybody off with a, with a hook or anything, but uh, speak for five minutes or so, uh, and this is gonna be about what you just talked about. Uh, then maybe I'll try to get us into a little bit of a discussion and make sure and leave uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, at the end uh, for questions from the audience, uh, if you folks have any uh, follow-up questions from there. Uh, okay, well, let me start with, uh, with Philip. So, uh, Philip, you've recently written an essay uh, titled Administrative Harms, just published uh, at Hoover, uh, where you argue that our current administrative state is uh, causing harm, both uh, in terms of uh, harm to the Constitution but also uh, in terms of harm to contemporary politics. Uh, could I ask you, and I'm gonna ask everybody a similar question, to say uh, a little bit more about the sort of positive evidence that you have in the book, and then you know, follow up with sort of your normative prescriptions. What do you draw from that? So, so if you have, turn it over to you, Phil. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna start with a negative. It's very much easier to be negative about the administrative state than very positive about it. Uh, the administrative state 
is profoundly harmful. Um, economists recognize its regulatory costs. The advocates for agencies say, oh, but it gives us regulation, that's good. Some economists recognize not all that regulation is desirable. Lawyers recognize its damage to the separation of powers, um, but that's just the beginning. The administrative state is lethal to our freedom and even, I think, to our survival. The administrative state, first, deprives us of basic structural freedoms. The Constitution secures our freedom of self-government, our freedom to live under laws made by our elected representatives. The Constitution also protects our freedom to be held to account only in the courts, not other tribunals. The administrative state denies us these fundamental freedoms. It legislates through agency rules, thus diluting our voting rights. It adjudicates through agency hearings, not in courts. And this is the opposite of Republican self-government, and it's grossly unjust. So that's a constitutional problem I think is bad enough. Second, it gets worse, the administrative state systematically violates our constitutional rights. For example, and there are many examples, in-house agency adjudication denies both due process and jury rights. At least the jury right question, by the way, is now coming to the Supreme Court in SEC versus Jarkissi. It's a case in which we've been very involved. Uh, the administrative state is a profound threat to civil liberties. Uh, it guts all of our procedural rights, some of our substantive rights. So I think it's the greatest institutional threat to the civil, liber to civil liberties in our time. And that point needs to be hammered home in litigation again and again. Third, it gets worse and worse, you see. The administrative state is shifting to what I would call sub-administrative mechanisms. We don't yet have a good name for this, uh, but it's a very disturbing development. The Constitution establishes governance through law. This is sometimes known as the rule of law. It sounds very reassuring. The administrative state substitutes the rule of rules, which at least sounds law-like, even if of course, it isn't. But the executive increasingly doesn't even bother with either law or administrative rules. If a new statute or agency rule would be unconstitutional or politically difficult, no problem, says the, the White House or the agencies. <clears throat> Just use the threat of regulatory hassle to get compliance. Use the threat of regulatory hassle to get private entities, usually banks and other choke, choke point firms, to cut off disfavored lines of business whether guns or payday loans and the rest. This is regulatory extortion, and it's just one of many sub-administrative mechanisms that are becoming the cutting edge of the new administrative state. How dangerous are these sub-administrative mechanisms? These are what allowed the Biden administration to impose censorship through social media platforms. Nice business you've got there. By the way, these are the things we don't want to see, and it worked like a charm. Fourth. We have to talk about discrimination. There are many sorts of discrimination involved in the administrative state. It begins with racial discrimination, but that's another story. Let's focus today on class discrimination. The administrative state is deeply prejudiced along the lines of class. Its driving purpose is to shift regulatory power out of the hands of elected lawmakers who are accountable to us, the people, into the hands of unelected experts who are the elite of the knowledge class, right? So the result is lots of class-oriented regulation, restrictions on gas-powered vehicles and home appliances, or COVID restrictions that work well for the laptop class, but destroy the administratively disenfranchised who run gyms and restaurants and the like. Fifth, the administrative state stimulates alienation. How can you be confident in unelected regulators who have a different class than most of us? And sixth, and worst, I can go on, I'm just giving you six out of probably 20, right? Um, the administrative state causes political conflict, and this is the killer. The 20th century witnessed two very dangerous constitutional developments. First, the expansion of federal legislative power so that the whole realm of life could be regulated federally. Second, the development of administrative power, concentrating that regulatory power in the hands of, in the hands of agencies. Each on its own is dangerous. Together, they're destabilizing. The full range of regulatory power is now concentrated in agencies under presidential oversight. So presidential elections become do-or-die battles. Pol presidential politics becomes warfare. It's not an accident. This is created by the existence of the administrative state with broad regulatory power. So the administrative state is to blame for existential presidential <clears throat> contests, which threaten to tear the nation apart. And by the end of this year, perhaps they will, right? 
So the administrative state is profoundly dangerous, and anything we can do to restrain it is good. Thanks, Philip. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to mix mix up the order a little bit from our from our seating order, and uh, maybe turn to to you, Andy. Now, uh, so let me uh, ask you to, to sort of think along the lines of your your recent book, Executive Order and Bureaucratic Management uh, and the Limits of Presidential Power, and and talk a little bit about how executive orders and the role that the bureaucracy plays in shaping and at times even effectively vetoing those orders. Um, and so both from a positive perspective, uh, you know, how does that, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. And then normatively, is, is that a good thing or, or not so much? Great, well thank you and that, uh, thanks to all of you for being here and thanks especially to Brandis and the team at Hoover for putting this program together. If you were here last night, um, you might have heard Governor Sununu's expostulation of excitement when he saw General Mattis in the audience. Said, Holy crap, I think he said. Uh, um, and I, when I looked at the program, that's sort of how I felt. This is an amazing uh, couple of days that have been pulled together here. Um, but yeah, my recent work takes off from this sort of odd juxtaposition of image and fact, right? The image that executive orders and presidential directives generally are uh, a matter of sort of springing full-blown from the president's brain. He sits down at the desk, gets out the big Sharpie, scrawls his name, holds it up, <laughs> boom, policy has been changed forever. Um, but the reality, of course, is that the process of producing executive orders is uh, not immediate or even fast in most cases, uh, involves uh, any number of federal departments and agencies providing input and feedback. Uh, and what's more, those agencies themselves are often the proposers of the order. Right? This is a bottom-up process oftentimes. Um, then, as you mentioned, the process of vetting the orders uh, can lead you know, to huge modifications and even to an order not being issued at all. Um, it's the kind of peer review that the academics in the audience will be pretty well used to. Right, uh, there are a lot of reviewer twos out there in the bureaucracy. Um, so just to put some numbers on this uh, from my research, let me make sure I get it right here. Uh, about 45% of executive orders in my data came directly from agencies, right? Not from more centralized White House staff. Um, more than six in 10 are at least mostly decentralized. Again, uh, the preponderant input in their substance comes from the agencies and departments. Uh, only about 20%, so one in five, are preponderantly the product of the executive office of the president. Now, the median order takes more than a month to issue from the time that it reaches the office management and budget. Uh, there's a lot of variance there. The average time is actually more like 75 days uh, and a quarter take more than 90 days to issue. In fact, the, the outlier uh, in my sample took 1,646 days from proposal to issuance, that's four and a half years. Uh, so, of course, many issues, as noted, are not issued at all, and in fact, that may be as many as one in five of what, what uh, one OMB counsel told me were the serious orders. There are a lot of things that never even make sort of the real proposal stage. Um, the most common reason for that in my data, again, was intra-executive branch uh, input and dissent. Um, so what should we take away from this? Uh, I just want to make three or four quick points. Um, so first, uh, just a useful reminder, if nothing else, that the executive branch is a they and not an it. Uh, it's not unitary, but plural. Uh, we need to uh, take seriously the fact of the bureaucratic politics of policymaking and that they are ever present and crucial to the policymaking process for good or for ill, as uh, Phil would weigh in. Uh, we shouldn't abstract, though, away from the complexity of that, uh, as I think often academics, legislators, jurists, uh, citizens, and even presidents sometimes do. So second, you could go from that and think, well, this is terrible. Uh, not, well, one subset maybe of the way that Phil was talking about it, at least certainly in the classic uh, administrative state slash deep state sense that here are all these unelected bureaucrats, they're blocking the will of the elected president, we should deconstruct them all. Um, now, uh, there's absolutely plenty that could be improved upon in the way that the federal executive 
is run and that the US civil service functions. Uh, but let me just add two more points as we sort of move towards the normative side of things. Uh, first, the process I've described, so-called central clearance, uh, usually administered by the Office of Management and Budget, is done on behalf of the president. Uh, it's a way for the president to get information on the costs and benefits and substantive and political feasibility of a given proposed executive order. Now, sometimes the agency critiques do show the president that an idea that the White House might have had simply won't work or that some kind of modifications will be necessary to make it something that can actually be implemented. Uh, so it brings expertise, it brings institutional memories, the good side of the executive branch bureaucracy to the process, right? And it's a process often driven by the short term. It's not a bad thing to have long-term expertise applied to that. Um, as in the peer review process, mistakes are caught that might go unnoticed. Uh, not every executive order that doesn't get issued was a stupid idea, uh, but a lot of them, if you read the files, were stupid ideas. <laughs> so it's worth, uh, Remembering, too, that I noted that nearly half of executive orders actually are bottom up, um, not top down. They're originated by the agencies themselves, which means that a key part of the process is to alert the president that the agency itself might be trying something on, that they are perhaps using their informational advantage to uh, work a win in a turf war that the president may not care about or certainly might not agree with them on. In my own data, the departments of agriculture and interior were particularly notorious for this. I should note maybe with apologies to General Mattis if he is here this morning, uh, but I bet he was good at this. The Pentagon is also very involved in those kinds of turf wars. Um, this is a classic principal agent problem, right? And this peer review slash central clearance process helps to ameliorate it. It helps other agencies identify opportunistic behavior for the president's benefit. So finally, what this ultimately tells us, I think, is that presidential management and management skills matter. Right? When voters look at a candidate, uh, it's worth considering whether that candidate will be able to use agency expertise to their own benefit and thus, we hope, to the country's benefit. Presidents who can extract information while fending off opportunism are going to benefit their policy agenda, and I would suggest even their political standing. Management's central to better policy, to better politics, and so we should expect our presidents to be better at it. Uh, so to come back full circle, um, we maybe are able to get unilateralism in name, but the national interest in fact. Very interesting. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Andy. Let me, let me turn to, to Sharice, to, to you now for a moment, because this is a perfect sort of segue into your, your book, um, Checks in the Balance, uh, Legislative Capacity and the Dynamics of Executive Power. So you, you sort of, in that book, you have a sort of long sweep of history view. And I think at least one of your theses in there is that part of the dynamics of executive power really has to do with Congress's behavior, that uh, you know, how Congress either chooses to act or maybe not act. Uh, is a big factor in determining the uh, extent to which we're seeing the growth of the administrative state and, uh, and sort of how uh, the executive branch has moved in. Uh, so yeah, maybe tell us a little bit about why, why you think that and you know, what your judgment of it is. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brendis and the Hoover team for having me and, and giving me an opportunity to talk about executive power. Uh, as you can probably tell from Andy's work, us political scientists love to talk about executive orders and unilateral you know, power, so I'm glad to have the opportunity. Um, similar to Andy's, bu Andy's book, our starting point was thinking about this perception that's in the public and the media that presidents can use things like executive orders completely unconstrained. Um, and that there's this common perception that over time presidents have used more executive orders, especially to get around Congresses that they don't agree with ideologically. Um, in the political science research though, empirical findings keep repeating, like, repeatedly finding the exact opposite finding that in fact, presidents use fewer executive orders over divided government. And if you look at the patterns and the way that they've used them, they use a lot fewer executive orders over time. 
And so the starting point for our book was to think about why this is the case and maybe when this is the case. And our answer is really thinking about Congress's ability to actually constrain the president's use of unilateral powers. And specifically, we think about legislative capacity as being the key to executive constraint. Um, and we define legislative capacity as the ability of Congress, just in general, to be able to do its job. And so what it needs to do its job is different resources and tools, things like staff capacity, qualified staffers, experienced staffers, um, different sources of information that help them write legislation, so different offices and things like that. And the way that presidents have been able to use executive orders over time has depended a lot on Congress's ability to actually constrain them, which is dependent on legislative capacity. So Congress has tools to constrain the executive branch. It can limit its discretion in statutes. It can engage in active oversight, things like that. But it hasn't always been able to effectively use these tools. So we show that in historical time periods, Congress was actually a low capacity institution. They didn't have this type of staffing that they have today. Um, they didn't have independent sources of information. In fact, when they were writing policies, a lot of times they relied on the executive branch to write those policies. And you can imagine it's hard to constrain a branch of a government where you're using um, um, their sources of information to do so. Um, but as things developed over time, Congress realized that it needed help in constraining the executive branch and it needed the tools to be able to actually effectively combat a really rising um, um, source of executive power. And so it invested in its own capacity. It had a lot, it passed a lot of reforms during the 20th century, uh, particularly in the mid 20th century, that revitalized its staffing capacity, that gave it different sources of, of resources, um, created institutions like the Congressional Resource, uh, Research Service and things like that, that helped it become a high capacity institution. Um, and so we use data to look at the ways that executive power has changed over time um, based on these changes in capacity. So in earlier time periods, when Congress was a low capacity institution, presidents used a lot more executive orders. I think in fact, on average, presidents, uh, a president used about 300 or so executive orders per year. Um, and they were able to use executive orders to bypass Congress uh, that they didn't agree with. So we see presidents using executive orders more under divided government in these earlier time periods. So think early um, 20th century. Um, however, as congressional capacity grew over time, we see these patterns uh, reversing in executive power. So executive orders were used a lot less frequently. Modern presidents, and I define modern as like post-1945, modern presidents probably on average use around 50 to 60 executive orders per year. So contrast that with the, in the 300s that they were using before. And we actually see them using fewer executive orders under divided government. So this we trace in the book is because Congress is able to effectively use these tools of constraint because of the capacity that they have. Now, just because Congress now is a higher capacity institution doesn't mean that constraints on the executive branch are perfect, and I would never argue that. There's always could be room for improvement, and in fact, we've seen moments in time where Congress has actually retrenched its own capacity, so the 1990s, for instance, is a good example. And so I think that there's always room to grow, and we can talk more about this later, but I think reforms like revitalizing staff capacity, um, um, giving staffers higher salaries, making sure that turnover is not as high, making that those attractive positions. Those are sorts of reforms that are on the table that we should be thinking about in order to revitalize congressional capacity even more as an effective way to really limit executive power. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, so um, last but most certainly not least, let me, let me turn uh, to, to, to you, Michael. So, Mike, Michael, we've heard about the balance of power between executive and legislative uh, branches in uh, contemporary period, in the contemporary period, and how it's changed over time. Uh, and you recently uh, have written a book, which I see you, you've brought with you. Everybody Available should. on Amazon. Available on Amazon.com. It's a bargain. <laughs> Christmas is right around the corner. That's right. It's Stocking perfect stuffers. Uh, and uh, that book, the, the President Who Would Not Be King, 
considers a number of different components of executive power, including the power to control the execution of laws uh, and uh, uh, the power to control the administrative state. Could I ask you to say a little bit more about your, your broader argument uh, and uh, what we can learn from history uh, about uh, how to think uh, about the administrative state and the control of it along lines that we've heard from our other panelists? Uh, thank you. First, autobiographical note. Uh, uh, I used to be that guy in OMB who was the one who reviewed the executive orders under uh, President Reagan. I was, I think, the last person who would fly spec them before they uh, went over for think you're final file, approval. So, so I so uh, <laughs> resonated a great deal. I'm also going to try to uh, uh, put my comments in the context of what we've just been uh, hearing. And the, the, the topic I think you asked me to address, I'm going to frame it slightly differently, which is what is the connection between constitutional law and institutional reform? Because these two, I would submit, are not always uh, the same. And in particular, when we, you begin asking me about the balance of power between the executive and legislative branches, and indeed, when you think of the idea of separation of powers, and then you, you, know, you look at the, uh, at the Constitution, it looks as though what we're going to be talking about is conflict between judiciary, legislative, and executive. Um, but uh, I think that the idea of executive power actually obscures the most important uh, differences that we see in this uh, arena and make it hard, make constitutional uh, legal reform uh, harder. Because the executive branch, it, it isn't a, a, an it, it is in fact a they, but it's most importantly two different things. On the one hand, you have a, a president more or less democratically elected, and then you have you know, vast numbers of, uh, of uh, uh, in, uh, the entrenched bureaucracy. A lot of people like to use the word deep state. I don't like that because it feels very conspiratorial. So let's just talk about the entrenched bureaucracy. And they were there you know, before you know, President Biden was elected, they'll be there after he goes, and they are there forever, right? And so I think those two, and these produce two quite different problems. And so to talk about the executive branch and the separation of problems that it presents uh, obscures the fact that we really are talking about two entirely different problems. It, each of those sides of it present problems, but they are different and almost opposite. So let's talk first about the, the, the first part, the president himself. And the danger here is uh, executive unilateralism. The president being able to do things uh, that, that Congress never adopted, Congress, uh, that Congress is opposes. It's uh, uh, in examples just from very recent history. We have the example of a president simply refusing uh, to enforce the immigration laws. We have several examples under Obama, Trump, and Biden of the president spending money that Congress explicitly chose not to appropriate. Um, you know, think about the, the wall. Uh, but most recently, the uh, uh, President Biden's effort to, uh, to basically uh, pay off all of the student loan debt without any plausible uh, authorization. Um, also such things in, in the you know, worldwide arena. How about starting wars? My copy of the Constitution says that it's Congress that has the power to declare war. What were we doing for eight or nine months fighting a major league war in Libya uh, and the president didn't even go to Congress and ask? Right? So, uh, so warfare uh, is an example. Uh, the uh, uh, environmental law, essentially the executive branch, the president, coming from top down, the president decided to rewrite the focus of the Clean Air Act uh, in ways which were completely uh, uh, transformative and so forth. So that's one half of the problem. Uh, and, and what are the constitutional law uh, elements that can be brought in uh, to curb this? It is. Primarily, I'm sorry to say today, the courts, because Congress is not in a good position to check 
the president. I'd, I'd love, love to talk to, to, to you, Sharice, a little bit more about the congressional checks that you think have been effective with respect to, to um, executive orders. But, but the, the way I see this is all it takes is for the president to have the support of one third of one of the branches of Congress, and he can, and, 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 and he can stop Congress from, uh, from checking him. So all, because he can veto any legislation that might come through Congress that would cut back or, uh, or, or, or change the policy. And then there's, the, of course, the, the general problem of Congress uh, being so debilitated that it can't do anything even aside from uh, the veto. So the checks don't really come uh, uh, from Congress. They, and increasingly, they come from the courts. And so here are three issues that we all read about in the paper, and I'm just going to flag them so, so we can see how these, what seem to be discrete cases and questions, actually fit to this broader question of how constitutional law can, can be brought to bear upon our institutional difficulties. Uh, one, prob one question is standing. Who can sue? Many of these cases, that's the hardest question. Like when, when uh, President Obama decided not to enforce a major portion of the immigration laws, it, uh, you know, who could sue? Well, it turned out the state of Texas sued because one of the downstream implications of this was that they had to issue more driver's licenses and that cost money. Why aren't people laughing? <laughs> uh, that, it, 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 it is a joke, but it isn't a joke. It's the honest to goodness truth. The challenge to the, um, uh, to the lifting of student loans was made by the state of Missouri based upon a really peculiar little uh, technicality in the way the state of Missouri does its, uh, its business. Uh, there is no straightforward way to bring most of these challenges in, uh, in, in court. And, and that, I think, is a, is a huge problem and something we need to be doing more, more thinking about. Second thing, you've probably heard the phrase Chevron deference. Well, what is that? That is the idea that the courts defer to any reasonable interpretation by the executive branch of its operating statutes. By reasonable, I don't mean the best interpretation. I mean anything that's like not completely fanciful, uh, the courts will, uh, uh, will defer to. Well, why is that important? It's because in most of these cases, what it really comes, the case really comes down to what does, did the statute give the president the power to do X? And the president doesn't just march in and to court and say, well, I just made it up. Uh, what he does is his lawyers go into court and they find you know, some provision that if you squint at it and you put it under a, an, under a prism rather than a, a, micro, rather than a, 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 a microscope and you, you stomp on it a little bit, you can maybe make it uh, 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 come up with, uh, with the authority that the president is exercising. Uh, I think that the, the Supreme Court has, has cottoned on to this device and that they are no longer persuaded that they should defer to this. Let me quickly distinguish, though, because it makes perfectly good sense for the courts who do not know anything. I speak as a former judge. <laughs> uh, it is, makes perfectly good sense for judges to defer to agencies with respect to how to effectuate the powers that they honestly have. Like, you know, you know, how many parts per million of whatever is, and stuff, defer to the agencies. But whether the executive branch has been given the authority in the first place is an entirely different question. If you defer to the executive branch on that, you're basically letting the executive branch do whatever, uh, whatever they want. And the third piece of this that I'm sure you all read from the newspaper because it's become such a bogeyman uh, is what the Supreme Court calls, I think it's an unfortunate use of the language, but they call the major questions doctrine. What does this mean? It means that we should not interpret statutes to 
uh, to, to impart to the president major new powers that were never discussed, not contemplated, and, you know, and therefore unlikely. I think that's just a matter of common sense statutory interpretation. Uh, but uh, I think labeling it the major questions doctrine makes it look like a thing, and it has become very controversial. I think it's quite important because the main feature here uh, of executive branch presidential overreach has been interpreting statutes to impart power uh, that Congress never intended. And I've used up all my time, so I can't even talk about the entrenched bureaucracy, but I had some points to make about that as well. <laughs> No, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, let, let me sort of try to sum up a little bit and, and go back to each of you because inevitably I'm going to mischaracterize your guys' views. Uh, but um, let me ask you sort of how concerned are you about the administrative state and its role and what's the best uh, way to address those concerns? Um, what's the best channel to address those concerns? Maybe I'll start, just go in the same order, start with you, Philip. I, I, think, I think I know the answer to the first question. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'll, I'll try to reconsider, but on the whole, the administrative state seems to me a problem. If you worry about distrust in our institutions and whether the Constitution is still a viable document, you know, it would be good just to give the Constitution a chance. We're not living with our institutions as established by the Constitution. We're living with an executive which is exercising a vast amount of legislative and judicial power. And inevitably, that has consequences for how we view the executive. I think the executive could rapidly restore our sense of confidence in it if it stopped exercising unconstitutional power, if it stopped adjudicating, taking away our rights to be in court with a judge and jury, if it stopped uh, legislating you know, what is it, why is it doing that? The president and the agencies are not representative bodies. We need, uh, just as a practical matter, even if not as a matter of principle, to have a mode of legislation that is connected to us, that responds to us. Uh, societies do not generally survive if there is not a feedback loop between the people and the government, and that's called representative government. Uh, so we need to go back to that. So we have a very good plan for getting back to responsible government in which we have great confidence, and that's the Constitution. And it's not a matter of originalism, it's a matter of principle. Um, now, go ahead, Mike, you want to chime in? Just just kind of, yeah, I was, I was Please. just so, so Thank stop you. doing it is, is the, is the yeah. answer. You know, it reminds me of King Canute's barons who told him, you know, the, the tides are doing all this damage. And, and so King Canute marches out into the ocean and says, stop doing it. Uh, it that's not a solution, right. Philip. I, I am <laughs> flattered to be compared to royalty. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, but I, but no, I, I'm obviously no King Canute. Um, I, so as a practical matter, I think we do have tools in front of us and they're very, very, they're not fancy, they're very, very basic. The most basic tool, and here we have a lot to learn, by the way, from Eastern Europe and Russia in past times, right? Um, we have a lot to learn from the literature of Solzhenitsyn, Live Not By Lies, and of Vaclav Havel, more moderately, The Power of the Powerless. Um, we cannot simply rely on academic discussion or on fancy analysis to solve this. We have to be true in our hearts. We have to tell the truth. Um, so when we're told that you're gonna get an administrative law judge, you should always pause and you put the judge in quotation marks. It's not a big deal, it's an administrative law judge, right? If you're told you're gonna to get due process in an administrative hearing, you have to say, no, no, that's not due process. As, as Michael has shown very elegantly, Due process of law means the right to be held to account in a court. Um, it also means you shouldn't have a biased judge, and th these judges are not on bias, they're institutionally corrupted. So these are just little things. Uh, we, can't start, we shouldn't be talking about the non-delegation doctrine. What hokum? It's all about delegating, I would say divesting, which is the Constitution's word, divesting legislative power to agencies. By telling the truth, we can change the world. I know that sounds odd, but it, it, it's true. Confucius has a doctrine on the rectification of names. 
Um, it it's actually has obscure origins. I don't want to dig into that now. But he, 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 or at least his students, recognize the importance of having the right names for things. And if you let the corrupt folks in the Ministry of State define the terms and the names, you've already lost. If we take back the power to give things their right names, the world changes. That's, by the way, why Chevron is on the chopping block. This, you know, Relentless is one of our cases. Um, why? Because for 10 years, we have said, no, that's not a separation of powers problem. Instead, Chevron requires judges, federal judges, in their own cases, to defer to one of the parties as to what the law is. And that is judicial bias. It's not judicial def it's deference. It's not Chevron deference. It's Chevron bias. Now, I don't think the Supreme Court is going to go that far. Maybe Gorsuch will. They're going to shy away from using that very candid language because it's just too, too much. It will unravel too much. But that's why Chevron's on the, on the chopping block, because they know it's utterly corrupt and it's going to destroy the reputation. Truth matters. Well, that, um, that sounds like a sort of a philosophical uh, how-to. Um, but a Andy, maybe let me ask can I you. Can just 30 seconds more? Sure, go ahead. Don't go on too long. Then there's a practical consequence. The, the second tool is litigation. OK. And I just want to put that out there. Hardcore litigation, it works. The courts. OK, mm -hmm. Andy, so let me ask you about your view of okay. sort of where on the spectrum so are we, the, and then the mechanics, because well, you so have a different your question about what's, what's the biggest problem with the administration. Yeah. Well, the Congress, actually. OK. Uh, and uh, I think there's, well, I'll, let me answer that question in two sort of separate uh, pieces. One is, yeah, Congress. I mean, I think Michael raised perfectly reasonably the idea that we kind of have to just sweep by Congress, because they're useless, right? We know they're useless. We watch them being useless on a daily basis. Um, and yet, right, the powers, in fact, of the Constitution are vested in Congress, and Congress needs to muster the resources, the institutional pride, to take back some of its prerogatives. Um, you know, for example, I think you could shift the default power in the National Emergencies Act, in the War Powers Resolution, such that the President's action is not going to require a veto override. Um, but again, that will require Congress to get its own act together. Maybe that's too much to ask. What we then find ourselves uh, in the world of, right, is again, as Michael suggested, one where presidents are doing statutory interpretation. Uh, they have an army of lawyers in the executive branch, you know, and their interest is to their client is to find something in statute that they can use to justify what they would like to do. Uh, to paraphrase the late great Martha Durthick. Um, you know, she said that so much of the action of policymaking is not in the making of new laws, but the finding of new meaning in old laws. Uh, and the answer to that, I think, is for Congress to write better laws. Um, again, that's a, I hope, not too pie in the sky a solution. Sharice will tell us how to actually make that happen. With yeah, better, Charisse, this better is resolution. Perfect. Wait, just to add, can I add one no, thing? No, yeah, real please, quickly, do. Though? please do. Because the other side of this really is sort of, I think, about. Um, our mutual friend Dave Lewis at Vanderbilt loves to say, it's time for civil service reform. Um, it is actually time for civil service reform. Okay. Some serious thinking, not sort of the gutting of the civil service, but thinking about how you make government workers accountable through a, you know, I don't know, a merit systems protection board that actually works, for example. OK, uh, OK. There are some things we could talk about there. Very interesting. Yeah, but Therese, this is a per perfect teeing up for, for you, who I know will be <laughs> interested in talking about Congress. <laughs> for sure. So I, I think even if I'm going to take a step back from Congress, all of this makes me think about how our separation of power system was originally intended to be set up. You know, as we know, that one branch of government is supposed to check another branch of government. And one thing that we thought about in this book that we really came back to is in order for the separation of power system to work, in order for ambition to be made to counteract ambition, that our institutions need capacity to do that. So, you know, even beyond legislative capacity, which I can talk more about, but even the capacity of the courts, the courts do play, uh, uh, I think, a huge role in constraining the executive branch as well. They also need capacity. and, and I, I think in terms of what Andy was saying, in terms of civil service reforms, like we can think about ways to make the bureaucracy a more appealing place that people will stay for a longer period of time, that we really invest the resources in the civil service as well. So 
I guess my larger point is that we should think about investing the resources in these institutions to make them function as they were originally supposed to be intended. Interesting. Well, Michael, so it sounds like we've got the range of, <laughs> of views here between uh, the courts, uh, Congress, telling the agencies themselves they should just stop. How do you how do you sort of negotiate around these? Maybe the answer is all of the above. I don't know. Um, I th I, so people are not just going to stop, uh, but there also isn't just one problem. There are there are series yep. of problems, and they require different solutions. For example, Andrew mentions reforming the Emergency Powers Act. We should all be able to get behind this. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely a scandal, uh, and and Congress didn't mean for it to be the way it is now. We know that. Uh, uh, we, uh, within the entrenched bureaucracy, I think these are the hardest problems. Uh, I don't know that civil service reform is going to work, uh, but I look at things like uh, these administrative law judges that Philip refers to. This is really a serious problem. You have a dispute with the agency, and the judge you're before is appointed by the agency and is part of the agency and decides according to how the agency wants. That's just the way it is. If we wanted to have a fair system, either we need to find a way to, uh, uh, to move these into the Article Three, into the judicial side by having an entire third you know, uh, level of, uh, of the judiciary. But if, that's, if we don't want to move that radically, what I would like to see is for Congress to provide for uh, administrative judges as a core who are uh, uh, not different one, not some for Department of Agriculture and some for the SEC, but administrative judges uh, who who are not beholden to any one uh, agency and who are headed by somebody uh, whose job it is to make sure that people get fair-minded justice uh, at the uh, in the administrative agencies. The model for this, to my mind, is the JAG or the Judge Advocate General. A core in the military, which works ex extraordinarily well uh, within the system. So that's just an, an idea. I have, I have others, so but that, that's that would be one. that would be like a, a new executive branch agency, then sort of. Yes, it can't be an article. But standing at, standing outside of all the particular agencies, okay. but still being within the executive mm -hmm. branch. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, this this is fantastic. Uh, it's it's ten o'clock. Let's let's go to the audience. We have fifteen minutes and get some people's uh, questions or views. So um, I guess I'm thinking that the the fundamental problem is that um, since certainly well maybe since the great the the New Deal, but certainly since the Great Society. Uh, a lot of what's happened is that uh, the federal government has taken on all of these social welfare functions of society, and that's been kind of the fundamental driver of the, 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 the increase of the administrative state. So that uh, really the, the, the prime way, fundamental way to reverse that is to, in fact, roll back all of those programs because they've taken over all of these administrative functions uh, of society. And so that's a huge project, obviously, but it would have to come through Congress. Um, so I'm just wondering what you think of that and, and whether you think that's really the fundamental problem. That, that's, um, a that's a terrific question. Yeah, Michael. So if I can respond to that, I, you know, I'm probably with you on that, but I don't think the American people are with us on that. I think there's a reason these programs exist, and it's because they are popular. People would, people would vote out members of Congress who run on the platform of reversing Social Security and food stamps, and we could go down, down the whole list. And fundamentally, I, I'm committed to the idea of a democratic republic. Uh, was it Mencken who said, I believe in dem a de democracy is giving the public what they want and give it to them good and hard? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, I think he's right. No, fair enough, um, Philip. Yeah. Forgive me, but I, I, I would dispute the premise of the question. Um, I think we have to distinguish between two types of power exercised in the executive. Traditional lawful executive power would include the distribution of welfare and other benefits under statutory authorization. That's perfectly lawful. That is not what I would call administrative power. 
Um, there's no objection to that in my mind. The real danger, it seems to me, lies in regulatory power, constraints imposed through rulemaking and adjudication in the executive. That's administrative power. That's what's lethal. That's what's going to cause a sort of civil war, right? Because that makes it matter who the president is in a way that otherwise wouldn't matter. Um, so I think it's a mistake to say, oh, when you're criticizing the Ministry of State, you're asking us to unravel all these social programs. We can have a separate debate as to the value of the social programs. It's an interesting and problematic question. But the, the threat of regulatory power that is the core of the administrative state, it's a different question. That's entirely independent, I think, of the welfare state. Does that make sense? Yep. Andy, yeah. just to kind of a, just a take jump on, on this a little huh? piece of that, too. I mean, it's worth noting that the size of federal employment has actually not gone up over decades, right? You look, John Diulio, uh, you know, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania and of the, the George W. Bush White House, right, has written a book actually called Bring Back the Bureaucrats. Uh, his argument mm -hmm. is that, in fact, you know, the federal employment has been level. The federal budget, of course, has skyrocketed. Uh, and the difference, he says, is that a lot of the programs you're talking about, and I think this is maybe what Bill was getting at, is that, you know, these are cash transfer programs in a, in a certain way, non-discretionary to a degree, right, in fact, literally. Their entitlement programs, right? So you're seeing the money go out. Uh, where he has issues, right, is that a lot of what the government does is give money to other parties uh, and ask them to do things. And he says the, you know, actually the the number of people left in the federal government are incapable of running those programs well. Uh, and so what you wind up with is a lot of middle managers trying to manage contracts that they are incapable of conceiving, much less uh, implementing in a cost-efficient way. Um, so he has sort of the counterintuitive argument, actually the government should be bigger uh, to make it more efficient. Uh, you can take that up with him, though, if you don't like that make idea. Take it up with Julia. Do you have any, <laughs> any views on this, Sharice? Or, okay, anybody have any other questions? Uh, uh, I'd like to address some of your comments from the state level um, and throw out two potential solutions, one cheeky and one not so cheeky. Um, the first one is uh, when I was in a governor's office, we were the year before given uh, veto authority over all the all, all rulemaking. Of course, as a staff person, we certainly didn't have the capacity to suddenly uh, review these rules that were all coming to, to the governor's office um, to, to veto. However, um, we did we were able to stop some significant um, rules that, that uh, our administration didn't put together, but any administration would look at saying that they're unreasonable. So I'm curious about your perspective on uh, using the checks and balance system to access that rulemaking authority that agencies are doing. That's the non-cheeky. Uh, response. The second one was another tool we used was to send uh, staff from our state agencies out to the counties, put them there for six to eight months, and get them to understand whether the rules that the state was imposing on the counties, particularly in health and human services, were actually working or not, and what were the barriers. Uh, I don't ever remember, as I was sitting in the governor's office, seeing someone from a federal agency, particularly Health and Human <clears throat> Services, who were distributing all those dollars through temporary assistance for needy families or those programs, come to the, to the state to determine whether what they're doing is actually working for us or not. So I think, Sharice, about your question on your, your solution on capacity, um, I think the federal government has capacity, because otherwise they wouldn't be making up all these rules for us to have to follow, um, and then not knowing whether they actually work or not, because we're always requesting um, you know, exemptions from the rules. So maybe comment on veto making, veto authority by across the federal government on rules, and then also capacity, sending people actually out to see whether, um, and in a state for a year, a year to determine whether things are actually working or not. Minnesota. 
Sure. Sharice, yeah, can I yeah. ask you to, to respond to that? Yeah, no, those are, those are really interesting points. Starting with your second one, I think it's really interesting to think about the ability of these institutions to actually be able to like oversee what's happening and have information. And so this is one of the things when I talked about some of the reforms that were happening in the 20th century that helped Congress become better at overseeing the executive branch. Um, take something like the Federal Register Act. So before that act was passed, a lot of times the courts and Congress, they didn't know what the executive branch was doing. There are pr famous examples where they didn't know what regulations were being made. They didn't know that the president was making these executive orders. And so that was swinging a lot of um, the power towards the executive branch because they can kind of, it, it took a longer time for the other branches to discover what they were doing. So I think what you're suggesting in terms of taking that a step further and really looking to see how these things are implemented, um, I think it is a great one. Um, and then in terms of your first comment about sort of this uh, veto engagement um, of uh, regulations. So it, I love that you mentioned the state governments because in my book we have a chapter that looks at the different types of powers that legislatures have to combat executive power and one of the things we looked at is like the variation that there is of the power that legislatures have to actually like review um, regulations in the states and to what extent that they have input into that process and we find that when legislatures have that sort of a, that sort of ability that also helps to constrain um, executive power um, for these uh, state executive branches so I think both of those are really uh, potentially interesting ways to kind of expand those out Interesting. Andy, you well, have Well, I thought maybe you were from Pennsylvania, actually, because they do have a, quite a stringent power in place to review regulations at the state level. Um, by the way, trivia question on your, a trivia point on your, your second question, Office of Management Budget, back when it was the Bureau of the Budget, had field offices, and actually on behalf of the president, they would go out and look at federal agencies in the field to see if they were acting uh, efficiently, and it was cut back. Uh, hmm as early as the late 1950s, early 60s, as a cost-cutting measure, because OMB felt that if it was cutting everybody else's costs, it had to cut its own. Um, regulatory review, and I'd actually defer maybe to Michael on this, but uh, you know, I think what we will see, you know, we've seen an expansion of centralized regulatory review uh, by presidents really starting as early as Richard Nixon, certainly institutionalized by President Reagan, and then his successors have realized it's kind of a good idea to know what's going on. I would guess we are going to see a movement, probably not under President Biden, but under successors, maybe of both parties, towards reviewing independent agency rules as well. And certainly, my understanding is that OMB has always thought that was legal, uh, but there were political barriers to doing it. Interesting. Did you, did you want me? Th you that we had these debates yeah. back then. Yeah. Uh, what you describe, I think, is rather similar to the OMB regulatory yeah. review mm -hmm. process under Executive Order 12291, the only executive order whose number I can remember. <laughs> uh, but, uh, 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 but it d doesn't apply to the so called independent agencies. Now, I don't really believe in their constitutionality uh, to begin with, but even if you do believe in their constitutionality, we, I, or, I d did a legal opinion way back when. I was a, like the most junior lawyer in the entire executive branch, uh, but arguing that even for independent agencies, the president has the right mm -hmm. uh, under the opinions and writing clause to demand to, to have all of the proposed regulations submitted to the executive branch so that they could be put under review. And uh, that was just a little too radical, but <laughs> maybe it'll happen. Very interesting. I, time for one more question, ma'am. You've been very patient. Please, go ahead. So something that only Andrew touched on and only tangentially up there is the lack of accountability of the bureaucrats. For example, I live in a town that has an NIH level four lab, and I've heard several stories. I'll just give you one. There was a, a scientist that felt that her lab assistant was completely incompetent and wanted to get rid of that person, but was told that it, the procedure would take over a year and they would have to be working with that person every day for that year. And then there are things like Lois Lerner, 
who, instead of being held accountable for abuse of power, was simply permitted to retire with full retirement benefits. So I'd like comments on how it's almost impossible to get rid of the of people who are bureaucrats in the federal government who are in some manner misbehaving. You know, this is sort of toward this civil service reform question. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll talk on, on it briefly. I'm looking at that countdown over there, but I will. Uh, it's a long story. I'm happy to chat with you more. 15 but the, seconds. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we'll, go one, we'll go one minute. Okay, over. okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I agree. Obviously, uh, you know, hiring and firing are pretty important to personnel management. Um, one thing, of course, created back in 1978, I, I mentioned the Merit Systems Protection Board. I mean, that was designed at the time to make that process better than it had been under previous civil service acts. It's never been fully resourced, which means that you have these very long delays when you're trying to you know, get rid of somebody who is underperforming, who, by the way, should have appeal rights against these charges. Uh, but the manner of adjudicating that has just been extraordinarily slow and also inefficient. And in fact, you know, for five years, there was no quorum on that board. President Trump actually refused to appoint members to the board. It couldn't operate. That made the situation worse, not better. Uh, and so now it has a quorum, but it's still way behind. And so you're gonna have these problems lagging forward until I think you have some serious attention to an overall uh, fix to the system, which again, is going to be difficult to get through Congress, which will be, um, Tricky, I mean, we can go into the role of public sector unions, we can talk about all sorts of things I think that are, are relevant here, but, uh, but just on that specific point of hiring and firing, I think there is a mechanism in the system that if we actually try to make it work, might help at the margins. Well, thank you, we're, we're out of time, so uh, I should uh, let everybody go, but uh, thank you to our panelists for, for terrific presentations. And, and, and thank you for some, some really good questions which, which, got, us, which got us going. So uh, with that, uh, I'll let you go and uh, we're gonna be back at 10.30 for our next panel, please. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.